Well, good evening. Good evening. It's great to see you again. It's wonderful that we can gather together to worship our God once again, to bookend this Sabbath day with praise and, and worship unto his name. We're continuing our series in Daniel, and tonight we're in Daniel chapter 7, where we see this apocalyptic prophetic vision uh, of these four beasts rising up out of the earth. But we see how the Son of Man and the Ancient of Days have their victory over these beasts and over these enemies of the people of God, and the Son of Man receives an everlasting kingdom. What a glorious truth for us to meditate on tonight as we gather to worship. Would you please stand then for the call to worship, which which comes to us from Psalm 18 and verse 3. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Let's pray together. Father, we are not worthy to stand here tonight. We are not worthy to stand before you. And yet, because of your son's great work of redemption, we can stand before you cloaked in his righteousness to offer up praise and worship and thanksgiving this Sabbath day. And so we ask, Lord, that this time tonight of worship and praise would glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please do remain standing as we sing hymn 97, O worship the King, all glorious above.
Let us unite our hearts in prayer to offer true adoration to our God and to cry out to him. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, our prayer tonight is all about your glory. It's all about your glory and your majesty and your everlasting kingdom and your dominion over all that you have created, your eternal glory. You who are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we delight in you and we rejoice that you are our God. You are our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Father, we thank you that as we read in Daniel 7 of the enemies who assail your church and assail the saints of the Most High, we see that you in your almightiness have the victory. The final glorious, beautiful victory. And Lord, we thank you for how we've seen foretastes of that victory in our own lives. The forgiveness of sins that we've experienced, the redemption out of bondage that we've known. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who is mighty to save. You are powerful to save. And so our prayer tonight is that you would glorify your Son, the Son of Man, to whom the kingdom is given, a kingdom of saints. Glorify him by working holiness in us. We pray that you would glorify your Son by working holiness in us, your saints. And we pray that tonight this time of sacred, corporate, public worship unto your name, as we lift our hearts and our eyes to heaven, might be in your kindness a blessed means of grace to us. Father, you know the secret worries and concerns and troubles of every heart in this building. And so we pray that you would be at work as we see your sovereignty and your power to soothe and to quiet and to calm with a vision of your glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand to sing Psalm 93. <clears throat>
As I mentioned earlier, our sermon text tonight is going to be Daniel chapter 7, looking at the Son of Man receiving a kingdom. Our complimentary reading is Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 to 68. Matthew 26, verses 59 to 68, where we see the Lord Jesus Christ before the Pharisees, before his persecutors, declare himself to be the Son of Man. Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 to 68. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Let us stand to sing Psalm 110.
As we approach Daniel chapter 7 as our sermon text, let's pray for the illumination of God's Holy Spirit upon the Scripture. Father, we thank you that all through the Scripture we see the promises and the fulfillment of your love and kindness to redeem your people in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is the Messiah. He is the one whom you have sent. And Father, we delight this, this evening in the truth, the truth that he is coming back to judge. Lord, we thank you that you have opened our eyes and softened our hearts, that we are glad to be subjects in his kingdom. Father, we pray now that as we approach your word, you would be pleased to speak to us. Work conviction where that is needed, confidence where that is needed, but above all, please, we ask, would you glorify your name by revealing yourself to us in fresh measure as the Lord of history. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel chapter 7, and we will read the whole chapter together. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and they said thus to it, arise and arise devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, And the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one 
which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was, ex- which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came. And a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings." He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever." Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed but I kept the matter in my heart. Amen. This evening we move into the apocalyptic and prophetic chapters in the book of Daniel. The first six chapters are the historical chapters and they record the experience of Daniel and his friends as they go into exile in Babylon and as they deal with the various kings of whom they are earthly subjects. Those are the first six chapters in their historical, and now we're in these prophetic chapters. And this chapter, chapter seven, it begins with a flashback, because we're now in the first year of King Belshazzar, so around 552 BC. But it's also a flash forward, because it's showing us everything that's to happen through history and at the end of time. This is a lofty and mysterious chapter of Scripture to consider tonight. So there's a quote from Matthew Henry that I think is helpful in framing our sermon. Here's what Matthew Henry says. The six former chapters of this book were historical. We now enter with fear and trembling upon the six latter, which are prophetical wherein are many things dark and hard to be understood, which we dare not positively determine the sense of. There are some things in this chapter and in the other apocalyptic and prophetic chapters of the book of Daniel that are very difficult to make sense of and difficult to render a final judgment on. And that's okay, because the purpose is also that at the end of time, the full, clear revelation of the meaning of this passage is evident. But Matthew Henry goes on to say, 
and yet many things plain and profitable. So as we read this chapter, there will be things that are difficult to understand, but there are many things that are plain and profitable. We see in this passage the majesty of God, the certainty of the victory of the saints of the Most High, and the judgment that will come at the end of time. These things are plain and they are profitable. As we work through this chapter tonight, our three points will be monsters, majesty, and meaning. Monsters, majesty, and meaning. We're going to look at these four beasts that rise up out of the sea, and we're going to study and think historically about what they represent as kings, the passage says, earthly kings. We're then going to look at the majesty in this passage. We're going to look at the majesty of the ancient of days, ancient of days, and we're going to look at the majesty of the Son of Man, God who renders judgment and also gives a kingdom, establishes a kingdom, and His majesty in that. And then thirdly, we're going to think about the meaning of this passage in broad terms as well, and what it means for us as we go about are weak. So let's begin by looking at the monsters in this passage. <clears throat> They're called monsters because these beasts are not like normal creatures. When you read the description of them in these verses, you see that they are not remotely like normal creatures at all. But we're told in verse 17 that those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. Four kings which arise out of the earth. And it's, it's quite clear as well that there's a parallel here between these four beasts and the statue in Daniel chapter 2 with its four different segments which represent four different kingdoms. So if you remember back to Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this great statue that was struck by a stone which brought the statue down before it was crushed. The statue had four different segments. It had a head of gold, and that was the Babylonian Empire. It had a chest of silver, and that was the Persian Empire. It had a belly of bronze, and that was the Greek Empire. And it had legs of iron and feet of iron mixed with clay, and that was the Roman Empire. And then the stone struck in the time of the Roman Empire, and that was the coming of the Messiah, who would bring the pretenses of human power and might to nothing. So that's the initial foreshadowing of what comes here, where we see these four beasts, these four monsters. So let's look at them each in turn from verse 4. What's the first monster? What's the first beast? The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. This is describing the humbling of King Nebuchadnezzar, that king, the king of the Babylonian empire, like a lion with eagle's wings, with the wings then plucked off and given the heart of a man. It's the humbling of King Nebuchadnezzar. The second monster, then, is described for us in verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. This is the Medo-Persian Empire. It's raised on one side, which means that one side is stronger than the other. And the Persian side of this empire was stronger than the Mede side. There are three ribs in its mouth, and these represent the people who had previously been conquered to unify the Medo-Persian empire. And the command then to arise and devour much flesh represents the conquest of Babylon in 539 BC, and then later Egypt in 525 BC. The third monster then is described in verse 6. 
After this, I looked and there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. This is describing Alexander the Great, the king of the Greek empire. And he's described like a leopard with four wings on his back. Think how quickly a leopard with four wings on its back is is meant to move. That's what that's representing. And Alexander the Great finished his education with Aristotle at 16 years of age and then had conquered the known world by age 32. So it's the speed of his conquest. He takes over the world like a leopard with wings on its back, and the four heads represent his four successors, the four stable power blocks that emerge after the Greek empire falls. So we have the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt, the Seleucid empire in the east, the kingdom of Pergamon in Asia Minor, and then the Macedonian empire led by Cassander. So those are the four heads on the beast. And then fourthly, we come to the final beast. From verses seven and verse 19, we see that it's described as dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. And then verse 19 says, the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. It's hearkening back to the feet of iron and clay from Daniel chapter two, the Roman Empire. So this is the Roman Empire. We'll come back to the meaning of the 10 horns in our third point on the meaning. But we can draw an initial application from this prophecy and this history. Because we can look back retrospectively. You have to bear in mind, Daniel just saw the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar and the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire. But we can look back on how this prophecy was fulfilled in the various empires and kings of the earth who were raised up and had their day and then came down. And we can behold the greatness of our God, that he is the God of all truth, that he has written the end of history from the beginning of time and he reveals it at will here to Daniel as he lies on his bed. And all we can do as we're confronted with the greatness of God as the Lord of history, who's able to reveal how things will unfold and transpire, all we can do is worship and marvel at his greatness, for he is so holy, 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 and unlike us where we are limited and finite, he is infinite and glorious and majestic. That leads us on to our second point. We've looked at the monsters briefly. We now look at the majesty. And in this passage, we see the majesty of the ancient of days and the Messiah as the son of man. And this is a glorious intimation of the Trinity. And we see the majesty of the ancient of days and the Son of Man, first of all, in a judgment in verses 9 and 10, and then secondly, in the giving of the kingdom to the Son of Man in verses 13 and 14. The majesty of God in judgment and establishing the everlasting kingdom. Let's look first then at how he judges all the peoples of the earth. Well, who presides over this judgment scene, this courtroom scene? Well, verse 9, it's the ancient of days, the eternal one who is majestic in his glory, seated on his throne. The ancient of days who exists outside of time itself. And we see in verse 10, a thousand thousands ministered to him. It's a picture, an image 
of his glory and greatness as the God of heaven. And in verse 10, we see that 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. That's a picture of all the peoples of the earth, all the peoples the world has ever known being brought before the judgment throne of Almighty God. The court then was seated and the books were opened. And that's the vision, that's the picture that comes to Daniel when God gives this revelation of what the end of time will be like. And it's a courtroom. It's a courtroom with books. The judgment at the end of time. It's described for us as well in Revelation 20, verses 11 and 12. Then I saw, this is John speaking, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven uh, fled from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. It's extraordinary that they are books, It's a written record. Maybe you've had the experience uh, at work or with your family of miscommunication. You said this, you said we'd meet here at this time, you said we'd do things in this way, and there's miscommunication when it's a spoken word. We write contracts, don't we? We write contracts. The written word is a lasting word. It's a permanent record, it's a sure account. And that's why there are these books at the end of time, because there's going to be no miscommunication at the end of time. God has an everlasting record of the truth of every detail of your life stored in his books. And these books record the sermons that you've listened to. They record the grace that you've received? Is there a record then of repentance? Is there a record of faith? Is there a record of you saying no to sin in the power of the Spirit? Is there a record of prayer? The picture is of a courtroom with books that have a perfect account. This is a courtroom with no appeals process. There's no higher court to appeal to, and there will be no legitimate complaint about its ruling. In this passage, the Ancient of Days is described as having a fiery stream come from before him. And in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 33, the prophet describes the punishment that God will bring upon the nations who are unrepentant. The prophet says, he has made it deep and large. Its pyre is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. The breath of the Lord is like a stream of brimstone, the prophet Isaiah says. And that's what Daniel sees in this vision of the end of time. A fiery stream, a stream of brimstone on the day of judgment when the books are opened. The Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke of this in John chapter 5 and verses 24 to 29, where he said, setting forth the promise of salvation, most assuredly I say to you, 
He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. It's there in Daniel 7. It's there in Revelation 20. It's there in John chapter 5, the day of judgment and the Son of Man executing judgment. For the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of Man who receives the everlasting kingdom, and the everlasting kingdom is a kingdom of saints, the saints of the Most High. So this is the second thing that we see, that the Son of Man receives the everlasting kingdom following the judgment. We see that the Son of Man comes from above. He comes on the clouds. The beasts come from below. They come from the sea. But there's also an extraordinary ambiguity about the title Son of Man in the Scripture. Ezekiel is described as the Son of Man 90 times or so. And so throughout Christ's ministry, as he's describing himself as the Son of Man, there's an implication for his hearers that they must decide which kind of son of man he is. But Christ makes it plain at the end of Matthew when he tells the Pharisees just before his crucifixion, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And what was said to the Pharisees is also said to each and every one of us tonight. Because this is a sure and certain and definite revelation of how time will end. And so all of us, each and every one of us, as we're gathered here this evening, one day, we will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. One day we will be before that throne and those books will be opened. What does the record of your life show? Praise God that there are many here who can look back on their lives and see a moment of conviction of sin. See when they turned from wickedness and were given new life to say no to the rebellion in their own hearts, which God, by the power of his Spirit, graciously and lovingly took out in taking out that heart of stone and putting in that heart of flesh. Praise God that at the end of time, there will be books and books and books and records and records and records of God saving grace of saints through the ages, from every century, from every tribe, from every tongue who have been saved. Praise God that that will be in those books and that will be the majesty and the glory of the Son of Man who will be given this everlasting kingdom, saints of the Most High, called out by name, redeemed by his blood and chosen in him from before the foundation of the earth. And praise God, Christian, you tonight, that you will be among them. We are not worthy as the Lord's people 
We are not worthy of this amazing grace. To be able to stand before the ancient of days at the end of time with the righteousness of Christ and a record of God's saving grace in our lives. And yet, we hope and we pray that there will be none here. And when that record of your life is shown, there's no record of faith. There's no record of repentance, looking through the years, looking through the days. There's just no evidence that you ever trusted in Christ. There's no evidence that you ever turned from sin. Is that what the book of your life would reveal? Well, the word of God is held before you this evening. As the Lord Jesus says in John chapter 5 and verse 24, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. If you hear the voice of God speaking to you in the scripture, convicting you of your sin, showing you that one day you will stand before that judgment throne and you have no hope. Tonight, hope is laid before you in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death. He is gloriously raised from the dead and if you trust in him, he will be your advocate. He will be your advocate in the courtroom. This is a glimpse of the majesty of God, the ancient of days and the son of man. He will receive this everlasting kingdom, saints of the most high, who will worship him forever. Let's move to our third point and reflect on meaning. We've looked at the monsters, we've looked at God's majesty, and now we should reflect on meaning in this text more broadly. Because I mentioned about those 10 horns and that final horn. There are so many different interpretations of what those horns might be, have been, could be, will be. To share some of them, some have said that the horns represent the the Turkish Empire, others have said the horns represent particular Roman emperors, others have said the Pope, and there are some modern readers who could talk about uh, the mo- modern Europe even being part of this historical scheme. So there's a diversity and there's a range of interpretations of what these horns are. And so it's important then as we study this passage, we think about meaning, that we distinguish between historical meaning and ultimate meaning. Historical meaning and ultimate meaning. There is a particular historical meaning. One interpretation is correct. It will be shown at the end of time that Luther was right. It was the Turkish Empire, or Calvin was right, and it was the Roman emperors. That will be made clear. Many commentators, however, withhold their judgment. And instead, they say, think about the ultimate meaning. What is the ultimate meaning as we look at these horns and how they work against the saints of the Most High? What is this ultimately a picture of? of. Verse 11, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Verses 21 and 22 in Daniel 7, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. 
That is the ultimate meaning of this passage. The saints of the Most High face many enemies. They face mighty enemies. They face powerful enemies. But in the end, they have victory because the Ancient of Days makes his judgment. And his judgment is in favor of the saints. That is the ultimate meaning, the triumph of God in the salvation of his people. One commentator put it like this in describing the meaning of this passage. The church shall continue militant to the end of time and triumphant to the endless ages of eternity. The church shall continue militant to the end of time and triumphant to the endless ages of eternity. Throughout our lives until Christ returns, we are the church militant. And we are called each day to wage war against the world, the flesh, and the devil. But in eternity, we will be the church triumphant forever and ever and ever. Triumphant through the endless ages of eternity. As the hymn that we're about to sing in a moment puts it, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. The ultimate meaning is that the enemies of God are put down, and the saints of the Most High are redeemed, and the Son of Man is given them as an everlasting kingdom. And we as his saints, as saints of the Most High, we have an inheritance in that heavenly kingdom. We have an everlasting inheritance in that heavenly kingdom kingdom. Our call to worship this, this day, this Lord's day in the morning and evening services has been from Psalm 18 and verse 3. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. And we've seen how that was true of Daniel in his deliverance from the lion's den. And in the next chapter, in Daniel 7, we've seen how that is true for all the saints at the end of time. We are saved from our enemies as we look to the Most High. That is your ultimate destiny. That is the calling that has been set on your life as a Christian. Therefore, it is God's will for your life this week that you should wage that spiritual warfare well and ferociously. Wage it ferociously because our enemies wage against us ferociously. And we should not be naive, but we should see what God has revealed in the Scripture and obey his word and see the nature of reality as it is laid before us in this prophecy. In verse 28, we see that Daniel kept this matter in his heart. He kept it in his heart. He had this vision of the end of time in the first year of Belshazzar's reign before the writing was on the wall. This was revealed to him, and he kept it in his heart. We similarly should keep this revelation of the end of time in our hearts to strengthen us and to guide us as we look towards that coming day when we see the Son of Man return in the clouds with glory. Let's pray together.
Father, your majesty is infinite. Your glory is beyond us. We can't grasp it. We can barely comprehend the revelation of it. But Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you that you have spoken. We thank you that Daniel had these visions. And we thank you that they show us the end of time. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us to live for you this week to continue repenting of all of our sins, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and walking on that narrow path until that final day. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let us stand to sing hymn number 16, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. come now to, to bless us as we end our service. Blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>